Lord, yes, Lord, you are our shepherd. We shall not want, we shall not fear, we shall not fret. We know the God we have believed, and we are persuaded that you are able to keep that which we have committed to you until that day. We pray, therefore, that as we gather to worship you, you would draw us to yourself by your spirit. Lord, there are people all over the world, St. Franciscans in the diaspora. There are people here in Uganda, Lord, who are watching. We pray that as they join in this service, in this worship, that your Holy Spirit would reach out to each one of them, minister to families, minister to individuals. So come, Holy Spirit, and take your place. Govern the airwaves. We pray in Jesus' name that, Lord, your word would reach out to your people uninterrupted and do it to the glory and greater praise of your name. In Jesus' 
mighty name we do pray. Amen and amen. We bless the Lord for this Sunday, and God has given us another opportunity to worship him. We bring greetings to you all in the mighty name of Jesus. We welcome you to this broadcast, and we are here, we are streaming live uh, from St. Francis Chapel, Makerere University. And we are so glad that you could join us. Uh, please do alert somebody who is not yet online. This is an online church now. And we pray that God will richly bless you. We welcome our family TV audience. Uh, those of you who are, who are students, you know, who may be having challenges of data, but you, are, have, you have access to television, just switch on to family TV. We bless the Lord for the gift of a new week. And we uh, sympathize with those who have lost their loved ones in a very special way. I want to bring uh, our heartfelt condolences to Solomon uh, of Pio, who lost a mother. And uh, we couldn't join you physically because of the uh, reason, uh, obvious reasons that you know. There's now minimal ministry of presence, but we supported you in prayer. And many others, St. Franciscans, who are sick or have lost your loved ones, we are praying for you. God is faithful. He is with you. We grieve with you. We mourn with you. But remember, Jesus promised never to leave us nor to forsake us. So you're not alone. The Lord is with, is with you. You can mourn, yes, but with hope. And we know that God will intervene in our situation here in Uganda. And so let us now join the praise team again to worship the Lord. You know, in the comfort of your living rooms, just stand and sing and raise your hands. Worship the Lord because he's there. God is not limited by space and he will richly bless you today. We praise the living God this morning. Our God is alive and we will worship him always. Join with us. Clap your hands. Dance to the Lord. He is worthy of all praise and all honor. Hallelujah.
Jehovah, you are, um, you are our mountain mover. You are Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. We worship you, Lord. We worship you with the lifting up of our hands, with the opening up of our lips and sing to you and say, you deserve the glory, you deserve the highest praise. Abba, Father. Belongs to you. 
Praise the Lord. Our reading this morning is from the first letter of Paul to the Thessalonians, chapter 4, beginning from verse 13, and chapter 5, verse 11. First Thessalonians, chapter 4, verse 13, and chapter 5, verse 11. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with a voice of an archangel, and with a sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the, cl in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Chapter 5, verse 11. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. This is the word of God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. We are preparing for the return of the Lord Jesus. The Lord is coming again. And my prayer for you and for myself is that when he comes, we will be ready. That we are not taken unaware. And so today we are so privileged to be having yet another powerful teaching. But before I go into that, I would like to now request that um, you reach out to your phone and uh, let's give to the Lord because the work of Christ uh, must go on. We, I have already said that the gospel of Jesus Christ is free. There's a lot of commercialization of the gospel, but the gospel of Jesus Christ is free because Jesus paid it all. But its propagation is costly. And so uh, we need to give to the Lord in accordance with his word. Remember that God gives a cheerful giver. And it's more blessed to give than to receive. So please do follow the prompts uh, given or shared on your screen. And uh, you can do this throughout the week. It doesn't have to be now. It doesn't have to be now. Just get the information, write it down, and uh, you can always give to the Lord. Now, we have had a wonderful time of teaching, of sitting at the uh, feet of Jesus and learning from him and we are so grateful for our dear brother Dr. James uh, Magara uh, who has faithfully uh, proclaimed the gospel taught us rare things some of these rare and uh, controversial uh, things uh, but it's amazing how God has used our brother to give us this information 
And uh, we have had a, a summon series now for the last uh, three Sundays. Now today is the conclusion, and we have been reflecting on the kingdom uh, all in preparation for the return of the Lord Jesus. And today, a brother will be speaking to us on the return of Christ and consummation of God's kingdom on earth. I would like to thank Dr. James on your behalf and on my own behalf for uh, faithfully standing with us in partnership and uh, also to thank uh, Lona, Mrs. Lona Magara, who has graciously shared. Thank you for graciously sharing your husband with us to preach the gospel. And so uh, James is here, and uh, it was good to see you uh, uh, yesterday, uh, or the day before yesterday, yeah, participating in the um, call to pray, to intercede for, as a nation, to call on the name of the Lord for the healing of our land. And we know God is faithful and he is healing us. And so, welcome with me, our dear brother, Dr. James Magara, as he takes us on. I have um, deliberately uh, given him enough time today uh, so that he can bring this subject to a conclusion. God richly bless you. A very good morning to you all, and uh, we praise God for the day. We, as the Reverend Onesimus said, our hearts go out to those who are grieving because there's been a lot of death around. I think the reading this morning is very pertinent, and we may end at the end by just reading those words again because they are words of comfort, they are words that tell us about God's plan for the ages. And we need to really, in these days, remind ourselves of those words. Uh, in the first part of this series, we looked at God's promise of a kingdom, God's, God's giving of a kingdom to mankind on earth, and the loss of that kingdom. We also covered the promise that God would restore that kingdom. And we spent time in the book of Daniel, seeing the details of the promises that were given to him. And then um, we saw in the second part how Christ came in the days of the Roman Empire to set up a kingdom on earth. We spent time on that. In the last message, we looked at the church from the resurrection, but maybe really more from the day of Pentecost when the church began, um, to today. We didn't finish that. I'm finishing that now. And then we'll look at the matters that are most contentious. But I pray that the Lord will give revelation to all of us as we look at what the Word of God says. <clears throat> so I hope you can get the slides on the screen so that we can get going. Right, so part four, the return of Christ and consummation of God's kingdom on earth. In the last message, I shared how God, 500 years ago, began something. It was not intended by man, and the people, characters involved did not realize what was happening. But when Martin Luther nailed the thesis on the Castle Church uh, in, on, uh, I think it was 31st October, 1517, as one writer says, the sound of that, of the nails being hit on the Castle Door Church reverberated all around the world. Up to today, we are still having vibrations of what began. We saw how the church had gone through 500 years of growth um, and uh, pure persecuted, but strong. And then came 1,000 years of decline, a time when the church should have disappeared off the face of the earth. But Jesus had said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And the gates of hell failed to blow out the flickering candle of the church. 500 years ago, God began something. I also shared with you how uh, in uh, 2017, a team of us went to pray for a new reformation, that God would accelerate the work that he had begun 500 years ago. And that's my, me and a friend of mine standing at the Castle Church in Wittenberg, Germany. Now, I also mentioned how when the reformation resulted in a shaking of the, of the structured church, the Roman Catholic, the Eastern Greek Orthodox churches, they went through a great 
shaking. And uh, the Protestant movement sparked wars between nations in the ensuing battle between Catholicism and Protestantism. And we saw how, according to Haley, the number of martyrs under the papal persecutions far outnumbered the early Christian martyrs under pagan Rome. <clears throat> and Europe entered into a time of confusion and chaos, Christendom, should I say, and uh, it reigned temporarily in, uh, in, um, in um, many of the countries where Christianity existed. Um, and I did mention how even here um, in Africa we experienced it because we, we, the gospel that we received in the last two or three hundred years came out of Europe. So it came with all the things that had been happening there. And this is the nature of every restoration move, which usually brings a revolution of some sort. New wine cannot be contained in old, dried, set in their ways wineskins. It busts, we are told every time. New wineskins wine skins must be prepared. And uh, we noted that in every nation where Protestants in triumphed, a national church arose, the Lutheran church in Germany, the Anglican church uh, in, um, in, um, in the United Kingdom, the Episcopalian church in, the UK, in, the, in America, eventually as the pilgrims moved out, Presbyterian church in Scotland and so on. But the church, the true church, the body of Christ, had taken its first step in the journey to restoration. The last 500 years have been years of restoration. Uh, the uh, God was beginning to beautify his bride, who was sitting in the dust at the time. Uh, the word of God was being studied, and life was coming back into the church. I mentioned these different churches here. There were other subsequent movements that came. Uh, the Puritans, uh, I will not go into details on this, the Anabaptists, these are all movements that followed the Reformation. Interestingly, every move uh, that came, um, the people who were of the, of the previous movement would persecute the new movement. That has, that has been the story uh, of uh, Reformations over the last 500 years. Uh, there was a lot of hatred. Uh, I did mention the Mennonites were also another movement. The, Rom to the Roman Catholic Church, which had been the only government-recognized church for over 1,000 years, the word Lutheran was spoken with disdain, ridicule, and contempt. And the same attitude was taken towards all Protestants, especially during the 16th and 17th centuries. There was no compatibility, no compromise. There was no, it was, it was confrontation. It was not even, it was not even friendly. It was, uh, people were killing each other. There was no cooperation, as uh, we are now seeing increasingly happening um, in this century that we are in, and the days that we are in. And for several centuries after the Reformation, Protestants believed the Roman papacy to be the Antichrist, and there are books on that. Even today you find books that say Rome is the Antichrist. And the fulfillment of, Roman, of Revelation 17, Babylon the Great, the Harlot, seated on seven-headed, ten-horned beast. The Catholics believed all Protestants to be the Judas church system that had forsaken the truth and had fallen away from faith and became anathema. The Lutheran Church became one of the Protestant Christian denomination churches that helped establish and maintain the first restorational doctrine of Christ, repentance from dead works. And I'm going to run through the last 500 years so that we can focus on the message for today. Um, I did mention, I think this was the last slide we had last, last week, that every truth, truth that was restored in the last 500 years has had classes of participants. And uh, one book I'd recommend for those of you who are interested in these things, The Eternal Church is a very good perspective of church history. Um, truth restored is like a pendulum of a clock. It swings extremely to the right and then to the left and finally hangs in a straight line with a balanced message hanging in the middle of the two extremes. And that has been the story. Let's just take a ride through this and see. The Reformation sparked reforms. God began to work in society. And so there were social reformers. A number of the social reformers of the 18th and 19th centuries, John Newton, who championed the abolition of slave trade, John Howard, prison reform. Robert Rakes is the one who started the Sunday school movement and the urban of the poor, the teaching of the poor. His movement was really went around, uh, reached millions of people. William Wilberforce was another one. So I, I, I mentioned the abolition of slave trade. Yeah, I was also involved in the abolition of slave trade. There's another man called A.A. A. Cooper, who was, his call was in the, in the, on the treatment of the insane and the reform of labor laws. These were all reformers coming out of this Christian message that was now going out. George Muller, uh, who lived in uh, the city of uh, Bristol, where I studied, uh, the care of the poor, of orphans rather. And then William Booth, the Salvation Army, the urban poor. All these were reformation movements that were now coming 
into society. In the 1800s, something began about the, the teaching of the second coming of Christ. And I'll talk about this more later in my message because it has a lot of um, relevance to what we are discussing now. Uh, this is when there was a renewed interest. Um, it was flawed in many ways, as we're going to see, but there was a renewed interest uh, of the, on the coming of Christ. In the 1900s, uh, well, the other thing about the 1800s, there was a move restoring divine healing, which had been lost uh, in that same, in the 1800s as well. Um, and in the 1900s, uh, I think I'm going a little bit slow here. Okay, so in the 1800s, we also had the missionary movements. This was very significant. At that time, there was a sense that Christianity was going around the world, and you can tell in the hymns, I'll refer to the hymns, the hymns that were written about that time portray that image. By the way, you can tell a lot about the thinking of the church by the songs that are sung in that period. Um, that's an interesting one to, to, to discuss sometime. But at that time, you read songs, you hear songs about Jesus shall reign wherever the, the, the sun you know, shines. Uh, nearer and nearer draws the time, the time that surely will surely be, when the earth shall be filled with the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. That was the sense that was going on in the church at the time. Divine healing. Then Holy Spirit uh, baptism. A hundred years ago, a great move began in uh, Azusa Street in uh, 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 California, which has gone around the world. It's been the fastest growing movement. Initially, when it started, it was very persecuted by all the churches. All the earlier moves of God persecuted this one. But you know that God could not be stopped. It's the, the same thing began going into all the denominational churches. And I think the last straw was in the charismatic movement. When even in the Catholic church, which some people were calling dead, the Holy Spirit began to breathe there. And uh, today you have the charismatic movement in the Catholic church, very alive and vibrant. If you attend their meetings, you may think you're in a Pentecostal church sometimes. Uh, so God, God has been breathing life. And this is a view that I have of world history. God has been increasingly restoring in the last 500 years. And then in the night now, the, the thing you note that in the last 100 years, the tempo has increased. While the main restoration movements took place, took about 100 years before something major happened. Uh, in the, in maybe also because God allowed scientific advance, uh, travel, TV, radio, a message would spread much faster around the world. So worship and praise became a big thing in the 1950s. Uh, it was at some one point believed that there are only certain hymns you could sing in the church. People began to compose hymns. Um, and uh, it took a while before it got into other churches. If you look at our, all our churches today, we are sharing some of the latest songs. But that was unheard of, even when I was a student here in the university. I remember sitting in these pews here, and when, if you raised your hands to worship God, it was like, what are you doing, you know? Uh, but now, all that is a thing of the past. This restoration move has swept across the body of Christ. <clears throat> demonology in the 1960s, a new understanding of, of casting out demons. As I said, there were all extremes. There were extremes on one side, there was resistance on the other side, but eventually, a balanced message began to come out. Uh, discipleship and church structure is something that came out very strong in the 1970s, very controversial initially, and of course extremes as well. But the church began to understand the importance of discipleship. And then uh, the prosperity message, that one is still controversial today. But God was teaching the church that uh, being a Christian did not mean that you are as poor as a church mouse, which was a thing that was understood at that time. God was teaching the church that he's a God of everything. He's a God of business as well. And we are now beginning to have a balanced message. When I was a student here in the 80s, if somebody said they were going into business, it became a prayer item. It's, going, it's backsliding. That has been restored now. We've understood that God is a God of business. God is also a God of politics. That is something that the church struggled with for a very long time. <clears throat> so God began to restore that. And then in the, in the 80s, we began to hear of the prayer movements. The prayer movements, uh, really, if you look back in the 80s, in the 70s, you didn't hear much about prayer movements. But the prayer movements really linked with the restoration of the prophetic ministry. Uh, in the 90s, we had a lot about the apostles, leadership, and so on. Uh, that was also being restored. And then in, uh, at the dawn of this century, we began hearing about ministers in the marketplace. People like me who are not ordained, uh, but who have a calling of some sort, and who minister uh, we are a marketplace, or a marketplace person, but I minister as I'm ministering today. That's a restoration move. Now, I, I put in a slide on, uh, from 19, 2015 statistics. I couldn't get the latest ones. <clears throat> it shows Christians uh, 
still, still the largest group. I know the other groups that are growing, and some are saying Christians are, are going to reduce. I don't believe so. I'm not pessimistic. I believe that the word of the Lord spoken in Matthew 24 will come to pass. And I think we are actually at the stage of the greatest move of God that history has ever seen. This gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony. Remember, it's this gospel, the same gospel Jesus preached, will be proclaimed to all nations, and then the end will come. I think we are right on the verge of that. Uh, it's already happening, but it's going to be greatly accelerated. And uh, God, if you look at history, especially the last 500 years, you see that God typically prepares the stage. The printing press set the scene for the Reformation. The printing press, as I shared in the last message, um, set the scene. Just before the Reformation, the printing press came. And everything God began to do in the Reformation began to move at the speed of the printing press. Now we have something that is set the stage for the next great move of God, the Internet. This is going to be fast. It is going to be shorter than the other moves. Uh, because now something that happens, like today, I'm, I'm, uh, Reverend Onesimus always gives me these comments from South Korea, from people listening in South Korea, people listening in the UK, people listening in Swaziland, people listening around the world. And I'm speaking here in Kampala in St. Francis Chapel. So the stage is set for the greatest move of the Lord. Uh, it's called the harvest, the great harvest. Uh, and this is going to, I believe we've already touching the fringes of it. Now I need to talk about dispensationalism. That's what I told you about the second coming of Christ. Many of you may be familiar with this. In fact, this is the most common view about the end time. And I left this for the end, and I just need to warn you that I'm going to challenge your thoughts. I'm going to challenge them with scripture. And uh, when you leave here, we don't have enough time to go into detail. I'd like you to look at your thoughts again. So this is dispensationalism. Um, and let me first take it out so that uh, you can hear what I'm saying. <laughs> Uh, then, then you, we can look at the slide. Um, the return of Christ is the most eagerly anticipated event in the calendar, um, in, the, in, in the body of Christ. Uh, sorry, let, I went the wrong direction. Okay, let me leave it there. Just, just listen to what I'm saying. <laughs> this is what drove the missionary movement in the 18, early 19th, 19th century uh, because they were seeing that this was an event that had to happen. People sacrificed their lives. They left comforts of where they were living and came to very dangerous places. I'm told that many of the missionaries actually came with their coffins. They knew they were not going back. Uh, that was a level of commitment. And I said already the hymns of that, of that period uh, portray the thinking of the church. Now, most of the teachings of dispensationalism, which you see on the screen, were unheard of before 1830s. They came out of Scotland, a man called Edward Ivering, he took a different view from what was a common view at that time. He began to preach fear and pessimism. Uh, and his teaching, in summary, was that the return of Christ would be preceded by a lot of chaos in the world, and Christ would rescue only a few faithful few, and basically rescue them uh, from the disaster that would be coming upon the world. He told that Christ would return in two phases, the rapture, uh, he talked about the rapture, then the tribulation, and then the return of Christ, second return of Christ. He talked about a visible taking away of people, and then a return in the clouds, and then the millennial reign. Now, that has held for almost 200 years. Um, the dispensationalism is a very big topic with very interlocking themes, uh, promoted by people like John Darby uh, and uh, Cyrus Schofield. If you look at the Darby Bible, Schofield Bible, in North America, Schofield made it very, very popular. And uh, their view was the future of the earth is the removal of the church. The future of the church, rather, is the removal. It's the removal from the earth to heaven. And there are many varied uh, views of that. They don't take the view of the fact that the kingdom of God was already inaugurated, which I've been teaching here. Their view is that the kingdom of God will start when Christ returns. And uh, as you can see, I don't agree with that view. I held it for quite a while. I remember in the 70s reading Harlins's great, Let Great Planet Earth, in the 1970s and 80s, was a very, very popular book. Sells, sold millions of copies, New York Times bestseller. And then uh, in the 90s and 2000s, I'm sure many of you have been reading, and some of you right now are reading Left Behind series. I think it was Tim LaHaye. Uh, they, they hold this view. These are the dispensationalists. Basically, the world is getting worse and worse, going to chaotic, the Antichrist. They believe that at the end of the age, uh, the Antichrist wins. I don't believe that. And uh, hear me out. And uh, as I said at the beginning, be like those Berean Christians, go out and check. 
everything I'm saying. Uh, they also give very detailed accounts of what will happen. At one point, the Antichrist was in Europe, and the 10 European nations were the Antichrist. They became 27, 28. That one died along the way. Uh, there are all kinds of interpretations of current affairs, which actually did a very great disservice to the church. They took our eyes away from this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached at the ends of the earth, and people began thinking more about how quickly can God take us out of this chaos so that we can survive the Antichrist. If you think about the first coming of Christ and how it played out, there are scriptures. A virgin shall conceive, said one. He'll be born in Bethlehem, said another. He'll be called a Nazarite, said another. I'll call my son of Egypt, out of Egypt, said another. Now, if you were one of the religious people at the time Christ came and you had the scriptures and you were trying to figure out how it would happen, you would get it wrong. There is no way you'd get it right. The Bible didn't talk about Joseph. It didn't talk about Herod. I didn't talk about uh, the wise men from the East. When the time came, all these things played out. And the point I'm making here is let's not waste our time trying to predict things. Uh, let us concentrate on what God has told us to do. And I'm going to go into that. Otherwise, we waste so much time and no one, I can assure you, no one of these books gets it wrong. There was one who wrote a book in the 80s, 80 Reasons, I think, Why Christ Will Return in, uh, was it in 1980? I can't remember. And he didn't return. And then he wrote another book. And these books were all bestsellers. That's the craziness that we have in the church today. When Christ, then he wrote another book, and that one also became a bestseller. And that's been a problem in the church. I would say more about that, but let's move. Let's look at the facts. What are the facts? What are the things that we cannot argue about? Okay? As I said, the coming of Christ is the most eagerly anticipated event in church calendars. And it's, it will happen. I firmly believe it will happen. Um, believers are very divided on the matter. Who will have the upper hand when Christ returns? Will it be the devil or will God have the upper hand? And as I've said, dispensationalism teaches that the devil will have the upper hand. And so it spread pessimism as fear and fear. Jesus taught us to pray, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What does the Bible teach? What does the Bible teach? When I look at the Bible, I, teach, I see the, church, the Bible makes some clear statements about the state of the church when Christ returns. One is Ephesians 5, 25 to 27. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. That is the target. That is what Jesus is doing with his body. I see a church that has been made clean. And if you look at the last 500 years, God has been working on his bride, the people of God. And when he's through, the church will be clean, without spot or wrinkle. I don't believe Jesus is coming for an old, haggard, tired woman, if I may say, uh, called the bride, the kind of church we saw in the dark ages. I don't believe so. Uh, he's not coming for uh, uh, an, uh, uh, an underage bride as well. He's coming for the bride, and that's the picture we have, in her glory, in her beauty. And usually, you know, at the marriageable age, someone is at the prime of their beauty. The church will be the same. That is my firm belief. Secondly, it will be united. Jesus prayed in seven, John 17, 20, 23, I do, not ask for these, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. In I in them and you in me, that they may be perfectly one. This was the prayer of our Lord. Will that prayer be answered? Yes. I don't see any prayer of our Lord failing to be answered, especially his last prayer before he went to become the supreme sacrifice. You know, just as you sent me and loved them and even you as you loved me. And we can see this beginning to happen. God is beginning to bring his church together. Uh, some years ago, I wouldn't be standing here. I mean, I would be labeled a Pentecostal, um, but I'm here preaching. And we are seeing this beginning to happen more and more across the body of Christ, and it will increase. It will increasingly happen. The church will be, I'm not saying we'll become one, uh, complete one church, one organization. No, we don't need to. But we can be one in spirit, and uh, that is going to happen. And uh, we, there are signs it's already happening. If you're looking for signs of the end time, that is one of them. And then there is, uh, the church will be powerful. Acts chapter 1, verse 7 and 8, Jesus said to them, it's not for you to know the times or seasons. The disciples had the same problem we have now. They're looking for times, they're looking for seasons, they're looking, 
It says, it's not for you to know these things that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and to the end of the earth. And to the end of the earth. The church will be glorious. Um, Isaiah 60 speaks about Israel, but I believe it has a double-edged meaning uh, for us as well at this time, the people of God on the earth. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. Behold, darkness shall cover the earth. And we are seeing that now. What is darkness? Well, it, it happened in the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages. But even now we see a certain level of darkness beginning to come on the earth. Uh, absence of God's word. Walking, it doesn't mean there is no sunshine. No, it just means that people are darkened in their understanding. It says, thick darkness shall cover the people. But, look at that but, a very important but. Something is happening in the world, but among God's people, what is happening? The Lord will arise upon you. And his glory will be seen upon you. Nations shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to the ends of the earth. Go and make disciples of all nations. We see these things beginning to come together. Now, there are other things, but I think uh, that, for me, is a picture of the church when Christ returns. It's not a defeated church which is on life support. It's on drip. And uh, God just comes to rescue this church which is about to be destroyed by the devil. That's not the picture that I see in the Bible. No. I see a church that is victorious, that has extended what Christ began at the resurrection. On the cross and the resurrection, they go together. On the day of Pentecost, the church that has moved across the world and pushed back the powers of darkness, and the gospel is being preached in everywhere. Now, let's look at some facts about the second coming. And uh, we had this in our message today, um, as it's, uh, and so I will not, it's on the screen, I just make comments about it. The nature of Christ's coming. First of all, you notice that there will be a cry of the archangel. I think it's very clear there. There will be a cry of the archangel. Jesus descends. By the way, those who teach dispensationalism do not talk about the rising of the, raising of the dead. I mean, that, and the Bible is very clear. Just look at what it says there. You know? So the cry of the archangel, I believe this will be Michael, the angel of the resurrection, Michael, the warrior angel. Um, he, he will cry. I don't know what that cry is going to sound like, but I tell you that is going to be the most thrilling cry on planet Earth. I can't wait to hear it, and I hope it comes when I'm alive. Because when it comes, everyone will hear it, and it will signal something so powerful that Daniel was shown in Daniel chapter 12, that those who lie in the dust shall be raised. Today, as we grieve, let us remember this, that those who have departed, if they have departed in the Lord, we can look forward to this day. It is going to happen, and it will happen physically. It is not some spiritual thing that will happen somewhere. Personally, that's why I do not use the words, rest in peace. May his soul rest in peace. It's not biblical. That is Greek thinking. Uh, we're not going to rest. Those who rest, rest now, but they're waiting for the resurrection. They will get back their physical bodies. We shall see them, and if we die before he returns, we shall get back these bodies, and they'll be glorified bodies. Jesus descends. The next thing we see there, Jesus descends. And then it says the dead in Christ rise. If there is anything we should be preaching, it's not the rapture. I'll talk a bit about the rapture. I hope I have time to get there. Um, it is those in the Christ rising fast. And then it says those alive at the time it happens will join to meet him in the air and go where? Now, I'm going to talk about that in a moment. And it says we'll be with him forever. We'll be with him forever. Uh, the Bible talks about us having our resurrection bodies. Uh, let me just take out the next slide so that I can go through the points very quickly now and make some other comments. So we see, the first thing we see, whether I said in, in uh, last week we saw that this same Jesus. Uh, that's what the angels told the disciples who were waiting, who were watching him go up. It says this same Jesus will come back in the same way, in the same way. So, number one, it's going to be physical. Please don't listen to anyone who tells you it will be spiritual. It is not biblical. It's going to be physical. Jesus came physically on the earth. He's going to return physically. Secondly, it's going to be public. It will be public. Um, Luke 17, 21 says, like lightning flashes from the east to the west, everyone will see it. It's not going to be some strange little corner thing that's happening. It will be public. We've just seen there will be a cry of the archangel. Uh, Jesus will descend. Um, and then we see... Also that uh, the dead in Christ rise, the dead in Christ rise, uh, those who are alive join uh, the dead. It's supposed to be a type, it's a type of that, to meet Christ in the clouds. And then believers receive their resurrection bodies. This is a huge subject. I did a series of this, which is present in my YouTube channel. I preach in my church. I think there are seven, six or seven messages. 
Each of them is about an hour and a half long, an hour and a half long, about the theme of the resurrection. It's something we need to understand again because there's a lot of Greek thinking that has confused us about the resurrection. So we talk about may his soul rest in peace and all that. Where did those things come from? You know, it's talking about an internal state where you're floating on the clouds. That's not what the Bible teaches. Um, then there will be a reward for the righteous uh, is the next thing that we, we, we see concerning the coming of the Lord. Punishment for the wicked. This is coming as surely as day follows night. This is also coming. The Bible has a lot to say about it. And then we see uh, the destruction of the devil. That is going to happen. There will be a renewed earth. And it says we will be with him forever. The tabernacle of God will be among his people. Among his people. Now, each of these can form messages of its own. But that is the way I see it. But I see it very clear in the scriptures that Christ returns. The dead in Christ rise fast. That's what it says. Now, there are some words that I use for the return of the Lord. And I just want to give you an introduction into this. These are Greek words. The New Testament was written in Greek. I did a small course in theology when I was doing my doctoral studies, which was very, very helpful in helping me understand uh, get a proper perspective of Bible interpretation. And uh, one of the words used, I'll uh, just give one example, is the word parousia. It's the most common word used concerning the return of the Lord. The arrival, presence, active continual presence, and uh, the quote there from the book of, uh, of Second Peter, they shall say, they say, what will, so what is, where is the promise of his coming? That word his coming is the word parousia. Uh, for ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things were continuing as they are from the beginning of creation. Now, I don't have too much time to explain this, but we need to understand what this means. In the Roman understanding, if an emperor, Rome, Rome had many soldiers who had fought wars, and uh, the emperor did not want retired soldiers coming back into Rome. They can cause trouble, especially when they're unemployed. So Rome set colonies, Thessalonica, Colossia, these were all colonies of Rome. So there were citizens of Rome living in those places, but their citizenship was in Rome, okay? But there are cities like Paul of Tarsus. Paul was a Roman citizen as well. So all these are different centers. Now, if the emperor was coming to visit, what would happen is the Roman citizens, as often happens, so that they would go and welcome him outside the city, not to go back to Rome, no, but to bring him into their colony. It's a bit like when Queen Elizabeth came here. A very big event. Queen Elizabeth was coming. What happened? People went to the airport. People lined up all along Entebbe Road. Why? To welcome her. And when she was in here in Kampala, we could say, we have the parousia of Queen Elizabeth. Her presence in our midst. That is what it means. And uh, that would help us understand some of these scriptures, which we say we shall meet him in the air and all that. And then it says, uh, the another word is epi epiphania, which is 2 Timothy 4, 1. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing, that's Epiphania. And there are other scriptures that use that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that specific word, shining forth, he's shining forth. And then there's the word uh, ap apocalypse, ap apocalypsis, yeah, <laughs> apocalypsis. That is, uh, the quote there is 2 Thessalonians 2, 2-5. to this is, the ev this is the evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you will be considered worthy of the kingdom of God, for which you were also suffering, since indeed God considers it just to repair with uh, affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to those who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord is revealed. That's what is uh, uh, Apocalypse from heaven with his mighty angels. Now, um, I don't have time to go into the rapture question, but I know that's a very popular teaching today, and today I decided I, I'll leave this last uh, to challenge a lot of that thinking which has imprisoned the church. So I'd like to begin to wind down now and say that we will end where we started. Where did we start? We started in Genesis chapter 1. And I asked the question, will God's plan ever fail to be fulfilled? God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every living, creeping, creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth, subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. This is going to be fulfilled as God intended it at the very beginning. It's been a long journey from the fall to the redemption. God has a direction. He's taking us there. 
And this is the greatest thing the earth is longing for. All creation is waiting for this time when the sons of God will be revealed. And I believe this will ultimately happen at the coming of the Lord. And creation will begin to experience what it was meant to be. It's the cry of every human heart. Justice on the earth. No death. No sickness. No suffering. It will happen. This is the plan of God. It will happen. The earth will be restored. And our prophets of old had visions of this. Isaiah, for example, says, They shall not hurt or destroy in my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover that sea. That is what we are moving towards. Isaiah 11. And Habakkuk said something similar. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. God allowed them to see a vision of the earth when it is filled, filled with people, but people renewed man, new creation. New creation began at the resurrection. At the resurrection, we see what we will look like. We do not know what will be, will be, it says, John says, but when he appears, we will be like him. So when we see Jesus, we see exactly what our new bodies will be like. There will be some things that will be the same. For example, we'll recognize each other, but there will be some things that are different. For example, Jesus could move through the wall, uh, but he still ate. Um, so that, that, all that is coming. Now, Micah and uh, Isaiah also saw some visions. And uh, they say, both of them saw at different times, said almost exactly the same thing. Now, it shall come to pass in the latter days, the last days, the end time, that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of the mountains. The mountain of the Lord's house, remember the mountain, a stone that was cast out of a mountain in heaven which came down and struck the statue and became a mountain that filled the whole earth, Daniel's vision. The mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established on top of the mountains. It shall become, it shall bring down all the other kingdoms. It shall be on top of the mountains. It shall be exalted above the hills. All nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He shall teach us his ways and we shall walk in his paths. For the law out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. That word is going to be fulfilled. And nearer and nearer draws the time when that word will be fulfilled on the earth. I would like to quote as I come to a close uh, another book that I recommend, a very powerful book by a man who's dead now. It's called Paul Bill Humer, called Destined for the Throne. Deep insights on prayer, deep insights on the mission of the church. He says, that's the church, and only the church is the key to and the explanation of history. Therefore, history is only the handmaiden of the church. The nations of the world are like puppets, manipulated by God for the purposes of his church. Creation has no other aim. History has no other goal. And the book is destined for the throne. And this is my last slide. When all is said and done, we will find out that history was simply his story. God bless you, and may God renew hope at this time when we have so much death around us. We are destined for great things on this earth. God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God bless you. to lead in prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for your word and for this opportunity we've had over the past four weeks uh, to look at your plan. And Lord, I pray that as these words have gone out, your word says your word will not return to you void, but shall accomplish everything that you purposed it to do. And I pray that the words we've shared in this message that have been listened to, uh, first of all, live here on the first Sunday, but now through the uh, media, Lord, that you will amplify this word and help all those who are listening to go back and study Teach us. Help us to commit to the mission that we have, to play our part in seeing this gospel of the kingdom being preached to the ends of the earth. And Lord, we pray that you give us new hope at this time as we look forward to the resurrection of the dead, as we look forward to the return of the Lord, as we look forward to the renewal of the earth, because this is what your word says. You will visit the earth. You're not destroying it. Even when Peter says uh, the earth will be destroyed, it talks about a new heaven and a new earth. Lord, we are looking forward to all that you have for us, and we pray that you enlighten our eyes, drive out the confusion that has been there, and Lord, help us to get a proper perspective of these days and the times that we're in. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 Amen and amen. We give God the glory for this beautiful teaching. Now listen to this. I was um, uh, checking in in the chat room and uh, uh, getting messages here and there. 
This person says, this kind of teaching makes you want to go to a theological school. You are welcome. <laughs> Such power in knowledge. Thank you, Dr. Magara. The more I learn, the less I seem to know. That's, that's very good. That's a good spirit of Elana. And this is uh, another one. This is another silent congregant. And he says, this, no, first of all, he says, I am a silent congregant. This semester, I will need to write a paper on missiology following the summons at St. Francis Chapel just these last three Sundays. Now, that is representational of many, I believe. We have all been blessed by the teachings that we have had, and, uh, and as I believe with, you know, I, I agree with um, one of these silent uh, members of this congregation that this should cause us to desire to study more of God's word. What a wonderful history, what a wonderful conclusion. Of course, you have not even scratched the surface of uh, this subject of the second coming of the Lord, but this should activate our faith and interest in studying God's word. Jesus will return. His return will be physical. It will be public. There will be a reward for the righteous and a punishment for the unrighteous. Now, what is your response? What is my response? Of course, we are all at one time going to die. Should Christ tarry, we are going to die. And there, there are two destinations. And they both begin with the letter H in at least in the English language. One is heaven, the other one is hell. Death is sure, we are all going to die, whether Christ returns or not. Even, by the way, even when he returns, we, we will all, like, in a twinkling of an eye, go through death. So the probability of death is one. It's, it's not either or. But where will you go? What should your response be now when Christ returns? Will he give you a reward or a punishment? And I agree with you, doctor. I also actually, I never use these words, rest in peace. I don't use words like, if I'm not sure, if I'm not sure about somebody's destination, I don't say, we will see you soon. We will meet you there. Where, where exactly? <laughs> so we need, to be, we need to prepare. The Lord is coming for a, a, a beautiful bride. Well said, well said. Beautiful bride. And you and I are the, are the bride, even the men. Even the men, you, you, you and I are the bride. And so may God help us to prepare for the second coming of the Lord. If you were gathered here, I would have made an altar call, but I'll still make it anyway. So let us close in prayer. Wherever you are, you can say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for your word that has come to us very powerfully. Thank you for anointing your servant, Dr. James, to bring forth such a powerful word with clarity. He has demystified a, a lot of uh, uh, tough, tough things and uh, made them simple for us to understand that indeed you are coming again in accordance with your word. So Lord Jesus, come into my heart, I open the door of my life and I invite you in. Make it your prayer. Come in, Lord Jesus. Wash away all my sins. Write my name in the book of life that when you return, I will be among those who will be on your right hand. I will be among the sheep, not the goats. I will be a recipient of your reward and not the punishment. 
Today I declare that I am born again. Jesus Christ, you are my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. And if you have prayed that prayer, you are now born again. Make it very clear. You can send us information here at St. Francis Chapel. You will join one of those uh, uh, discipleship classes. We have groups. We have a provision for online uh, nurture and nourishment uh, for your soul. And uh, for the rest of you, thank you for joining us. May now the peace of God which transcends human understanding keep your hearts and minds in the love and knowledge of God and of his dear Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit rest upon you, be with you. May that blessing preserve you against coronavirus and bring healing to those who are sick. May that blessing bring comfort to the bereaved and may that blessing be on our nation and this great university now and forever. Amen and amen. To God be the glory. We thank God for the teachings we have had and particularly for today. Please go and study the word and prepare for the coming of the Lord because he is coming. We'll now conclude with a, a song and we thank God also for the involvement and the participation of a number of people who have put these songs together. To God be the glory. <laughs>